welcome to Integrated. This is the podcast where we seek to bridge the gap between the intellect and the will so that we can grow as disciples of Christ, surrendering all that we are and all that we have to the truth. Welcome back to Integrated. My name is Angela Erickson, and if you are new here, I'm so excited that you are joining us today for this amazing interview with Dr. Carrie Gress. Um, <laughs> and sorry about the 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 I don't know I was slow on the trigger there with the with the introduction, but um, uh, I'm really excited about today. I, I've had Dr. Carrie Gress on before, and uh, I just ha- I've been a huge fan of her work for a long time. But just before we get started, of course, I I have to ask you if you like this, please like, actually like the video, share, subscribe, do all of those wonderful things and feel free to check out ways you can support this podcast. Um, it just always is so helpful to me and helps me be able to put this out for other people to find, especially when we're talking about really important things like feminism and the occult. Uh, I think both are sort of, I don't know if feminism is on the rise, but I think sort of this awareness of the occult is certainly more prevalent right now. And I've thought for a long time that these things were intertwined very deeply. And uh, so, of course, it's been nice to see more attention called to that, calling feminism to the carpet a little bit and and shedding a light on some of the the nefarious roots of of the feminist movement and its entanglements with things like communism and et cetera. So with that, I'm I'm excited to welcome on Dr. Carrie Gress. She is um, she's a fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center and a scholar at the Institute of Human Ecology at the at Catholic University of America. Um, she's also the founder and co-editor of an online women's magazine known as Theology of Home. I know a lot of women follow Theology of Home, especially Catholic women, and she's the author of ten books, including The End of Woman and the and the Anti Mary Exposed. Um, I did talk about the anti-Mary exposed with her in a previous interview. So if you want to feel free, feel free to go back and find that interview is also a wonderful interview. Um, and right now she lives in Virginia with her husband and her five children. Thank you so much for joining me today, Dr. Carrie Grass. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. It's really fun to be back on with you again. Oh, um, it's, it's, I feel like this is such a big issue, right? Like mm-hmm. people have feel very charged and strongly about it. I've written about it. Um, feminism in some ways from the angle of like, why are women rejecting motherhood so much? And that was published Mm -hmm. in an article in crisis magazine. And I, I feel like I got a lot of pushback on that. Um, Mm -hmm. even though it was a more sympathetic view to why mothers are sort of, um, afraid to embrace motherhood, why it's so hard for so many women to be mothers. But it's really important that we drill down on where did this all begin? So maybe for you personally, where did this investigation start for you? And why did you seek these answers? Because I think a lot of us are afraid to know the truth. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Um, well, quite honestly, this was never really my intention to go into to women's issues. I found women's issues really boring and dry. And, you know, there a lot of it is very academic, too. And so I think that was always my frustration was the sense of, like, I can read this because I have a PhD in philosophy, but I cannot give this to friends of mine. I can't give this, like, this feels very unhelpful for me to be able to to help other women really understand human nature and, and the church and, you know, just all of these very essential things. And so I just, uh, you know, I, I said aloud, actually, when I was in, still in graduate school, I will never work on women's issues. And um, of course, God has a sense of humor, but because uh, here I am, I feel like that's all I write about, even though, you know, my, my doctoral studies had nothing to do with this. But um, anyway, all of that has certainly helped me significantly to be able to, to research this and see really where the problems lie. And, uh, you know, the, the, probably the first place I started talking about this was when my, my daughter, who was probably four or five at the time asked me the question, you know, what is it that girls can do that is better than what boys can do? And I, you know, this is something that I should have had at my fingertips, like a very quick, easy, beautiful answer. And I, I found myself really humming and hawing and not feeling like I was coming up with something that was very, good, um, even at a four-year-old's level. And um, so I I think that was part of it. I think I was also really doing a lot of research into Our Lady and her role in civilization and what, you know, what happens when civilizations are crumbling. And um, so these pieces just kind of fit together. And um, one book led to the next. I wrote the first book on Our Lady was The Marrying Option. I also wrote this other book called um, The Ultimate Makeover, which, you know, I I regret the name, but uh, the title, but... um, (laughs) 
But I think it did, does still say what happens is, you know, I think mm -hmm. that motherhood really transforms us in ways that we would never be transformed or would be very difficult to transform us um, into much more virtuous people. So anyway, it's I could get I could talk about this for hour, hours. I think it's very long. Um, it's been a really long journey. But I, I think the more that I've dug into it, the more outraged I've been that this has had such a foothold, especially among Catholic women for the last 50 years, you know, that we have bought into it and, and asking the question, well, why have we bought into it? And what are the parts that we can actually accept? And what is it, what's feminism really doing? Um, so anyway, that's the, the, and this particular book, The End of Woman, um, came about because I wrote The Marian Option, I'm sorry, The Anti-Mary Exposed. And in that book, I only went back to second wave feminism. I didn't look at first wave feminism at all. And I wanted a book that was actually more secular or that I could give to Protestants because, of course, the title, The Marian, or The Anti Mary Exposed, is really off putting from the get go. Um, so all of these things kind of came together in this book. And, you know, I was amazed at what I found in first wave feminism. I had had just had this belief, um, like so many others, that first wave feminism was this very pure kind of feminism that that we could really dig into and embrace. And um, when I started seeing like what it really was, I was just flabbergasted. Like, how is it that this is really what it is? And nobody knows this and nobody's talking about this and nobody's warning us that really, if, if that those foundations of the first wave hadn't been so corrupt, then the second wave probably never would have come about. It, really, the second mm. wave is the full bloom of, of the first wave. So anyway, that's kind of the long story short of how we got here. You bring up so many great points. And, and I, I did want to ask you about this particular question of Catholic feminists, because I was mm -hmm. An anti abortion activist for over a decade now. I, I started in college. I ran a, a Students for Life group on my um, secular public university uh, at a very, very liberal <laughs> university. Um, and I remember sort of, uh, well, after that, I worked for Students for Life of America, and it was very in mm -hmm. vogue to consider yourself a pro life feminist. A lot yeah. of pro life feminist organizations. <clears throat> and I can see that. I sort of adopted that title because I wanted to have some common ground with my mm -hmm. liberal counterparts to kind of, I don't know, extend mm -hmm. part of myself and say, hey, no, I agree with you on on certain things, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. try and build common ground so we could address the abortion issue. And after I left, I feel like so much of what you're saying comports with my own experience because after I stopped working, I sort of had this identity crisis yes. of like, I'm a stay at home mom now. And now my value isn't rooted in my career. Was I really placing so much of my identity in my career? Um, I don't think I'd realize that even as mm -hmm. a Catholic woman who was pro-life, uh, mm -hmm. I didn't realize how much of my life was rooted in feeling like I had to be quote unquote productive in an economic yes. sense. Yeah. And where does that come from? Mm -hmm. So this notion of Catholic feminism or pro-life feminism, do you think mm -hmm. um, that it's possible to be a Catholic feminist? Because I, I personally mm -hmm. don't, but I think I'd love to hear your perspective on what feminism yeah. actually is and if those two mm -hmm. can be, I don't can, know, can coincide and exist yeah. peacefully. Um, so, yeah, this I mean, this is really the, the fundamental question. And, and you know, I think if you go back to first wave feminism, the, the first person to really articulate the three elements that I think mm -hmm. are constitutive or the three d defining elements of um, feminism, even in the first wave. The first one is is the occult. Um, the, sec the second one is this idea of free love. And the third one is um, smashing the patriarchy, what became the smashing the patriarchy, this radical egalitarianism where you get rid of the church, you get rid of um, hierarchy of any kind, including the military, including the um, monarchy, et cetera, et cetera. All of this is coming out of, of the French Revolution. So that's sort of, you know, there, there's a lot of baggage that's already there that that is articulated in, in the first wave. Um, and it's articulated by man. It's our, it's um, Percy Shelley is this, this poet, English poet, romantic poet. And um, his wife, people probably know better, Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein. Um, so while Mary Shelley's writing Frankenstein, he's writing this poem about this woman named Sithna, who is this ide um, idealized woman because she's she has no husband and she has no children. And she's kind of the first woman in all of, of literature to, to be that woman. And that's really where 
what feminism has operated on is that idea of the woman who's detached from those kinds of relationships and she can really just focus on her independence. Um, and that that's been the focus from the beginning. And, you know, part of it was feminism was asking this question, not how do we help women as women, but how do we help women become more like men? Um, mm -hmm. so Sitna is sort of this, you know, disordered woman, you know, that's trying to be, well, she's, she's this idealized woman that's trying to be like a disordered man, the man that, you know, no one really wants in their life and because he's narcissistic and selfish and self-absorbed and lives for himself. Um, and this is in the 18, like 1810s. I mean, this was not something that not is in the sixties or fifties. No. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is yeah. way back. This is very, very early on. And so this was the fascinating thing was for me to be able to see that there's these cycles that happened that started you know, in the set late 1700s, early 1800s, and then they just keep coming back. Um, you know, you see the same cycles with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony in the uh, late like 1880s, 1890s. And then it comes up again in the 1900s. And then it comes up in greater force in the 1960s. So uh, it, it's really interesting to just look at those patterns and really see what what has been at the bedrock of, of feminism. So, uh, you know, if that's the working definition, then yes, absolutely. We have a problem being Catholic feminists because there's not a single piece of that that we can embrace. You know, the church right. is a, a patriarch. patriarch. <laughs> yeah. Um, the church has never taught that you can, that free love is a good thing. I mean, we know the family is the bedrock of society and civilization. This is what the church has told us and reminded us and, and has fought for. And, you know, it's been, really the, the, the opposition of, of communism. And we know um, that the occult is obviously not engaged with feminism. So, or Christianity, um, right. the occult, can't be, you know, is incompatible with that. So that's the hard part is that those are the, the, the key elements that have been there for about 200 years. And, you know, I know that there are people that, that have really wanted to, to reclaim feminism and make it something else. And, you know, I have a lot of respect for people that are trying to do that. I think that it's, it's a very difficult task though. I think because you have to define yourself apart from those other realities and mm -hmm. basically just redefine the word in your own terms, which doesn't feel like right. a very successful kind of recapitulation. You know, it's not, especially when you think about how much damage feminism has done. I mean, it, we, we talk about the cost to women and, and, you know, this is one of the things that's really motivated me, of course, is the, just looking at the metrics of how unhappy women are today. We, everything from depression to um, STDs and substance abuse and suicides, all of these things are pointing to some incredibly unhappy women. And then there's, of course, the body count. You know, you've got, it, it, it absolutely came, feminism absolutely ushered in this break between the notion that a you know, mother and a child have this um, irreparable bond. Feminism really snipped that. And that's what uh, ushered in abortion and then the numbers that we have. I mean, this is sort of unheard of, the fact that we worldwide last year in 2022, you have 74 million abortions worldwide. How many people died total of everything else? Some Somewhere around 64 million. So we had 10 million more abortions than we did have pe than people died of everything else. Right. Um, and that's, not, that's like the po twice the population of Canada. I think Canada is... Um, something like 39 million. I can't remember. But um, I mean, these are huge numbers. This is like yeah. entire populations of a whole country just wiped out through abortion. So uh, I think that those are the things that, um, you know, make me pause and say, why would you want to associate yourself with feminism when it has not, you know, we know we have to look at the fruit of something and there hasn't been good fruit right. of this. And, you know, I understand that impulse of really wanting to find common ground. And I, I wholeheartedly agree that you got, you have to find common ground with people to be able to have a conversation. I just think, don't think that this is a way that's actually going to be helpful and is going to move the ball forward. I think people are seeing the brokenness and that what they, what their heart really wants is something more beautiful and compelling and, and that suits our human nature. So it, it really just feels like it's, it's not, I, been, and it hasn't been that effective either. I mean, I think we've had 30 years at least of trying to do this. And I, you know, I don't see the, the Catholics even aren't our numbers on abortion and, and birth control are the, just the same as the general population. So it's not even working within the church to try and redefine this. I think it's just creating an incredible amount of confusion among, you know, all women in, in general, but certainly among Catholic women about what does it really mean to be a woman? And, you know, 
Nobody can answer that question. Exactly. And that's the other thing too, is I find so striking. I've, I've received a lot of backlash saying you can't really baptize feminism. Like it, it, words either have meaning or they don't. We don't get to rewrite right. every single word it because it, right. it brings so much confusion when we try to do that. That's what the left is actually really good at. They redefine terms mm -hmm. and we adopt them yeah. for whatever reason. And that's been one of the most startling things that I have, have, I talk about a lot. It's just how, you know, they've defined their position of what the cool woman is. They've also defined what our position is, what we we think of. You know, we like the human mind likes binaries. We like, you know, yes or no, black or white. It's fair. It's much easier to think in those terms. And so they've created the cool woman, and then they've created the doormat. Um, they've created the the woman who is part of a fertility cult and her red bonnet. And her, you know, we see those women marched out all the time because that's what they're trying to create is this opposition that's not real, but people think it's real. People think, oh, well, I'm, if I don't agree with everything feminism says, then I must be in this camp. And uh, so I think that that's an, a hugely enormous piece that, that um, women and men miss, but I think particularly women is this, I, this notion of the tribalism of it. And the fact that we, we want to fit in, we want to be, uh, you know, part of the tribe of, of the cool women. And, you know, we see this a lot, even in the church of, how often is it that there's some celebrity who's had this conversion? And then, of course, we realize like, oh, they, they're not quite ready for prime time yet because they haven't figured yeah. out like same sex marriage isn't OK. You know, all of these kinds of things. And then suddenly they're dropped like a hot, hot potato. So there is that desire to sort of feel like, um, you know, our, our faith is can be accepted by the cool people. But that's really what, what I think what is is damaging us so much is instead of trying to fit our faith into this this lane of popularity why are we not offering people an off ramp to see something totally different and totally beautiful and that doesn't at all correspond with the handmaid's tale submissive nonsense um so i think that's really what the task of catholic women is today and and it's not it can't come from men men are not going to talk about this they you know men have been so beaten down by feminism it's like kryptonite, you know, that you can just hear um, how much they do not want to talk about it. And, um, you know, it's it's actually the, probably the most effective way that I have to end a conversation with a man on like an airplane or something, as I just say, I write about feminism <laughs> and the conversation is over. Um, That's hilarious. So, yeah, because yeah. They, they would probably actually realize oh, you don't mean that you're in favor of feminism, but they probably just assume the word. They just assume. Right? They're right, black-pilled. Exactly. I think a lot of yeah. people, especially men these days, are sort of becoming black-pilled, and that's a whole nother mm -hmm. cultural problem that we're having because right. um, people are not getting married. There's there's not wow. trust between the sexes. They don't, uh, they don't view each other as complementary anymore. We're mm -hmm. at odds with each other, and that's another yeah. result of feminism. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And I have to wonder too, like when, when I was doing pro-life work, we always talked about like, yes, women, you can do it all. You can have it all. Mm -hmm. You can be a mom and you can still ch achieve your dreams and everything else. Yada, right. yada, yada. And right. I feel like we're setting women up for failure and they become mm -hmm. disillusioned when they realize, oh, I can't have it all because yeah. life doesn't allow us to have it all. Life is about choices, mm -hmm. hard choices. And I yeah. feel like no one in the Catholic, like Catholic pro-life feminist movement has given me an answer for that. Why mm -hmm. are we telling women they can have it all? And that's just not true. Mm -hmm. That's not yeah. true. And often well, our dreams change after we have children. And that, I think that's exactly right too. Um, and this has been one of the things I've, I've, it's not in my book, but I've really started thinking about it deeply is um, you know, there was a study done by men. Uh, a thousand men were asked, what's the difference between a good man and a real man? And, you know, the answers are very similar all around the world. Um, the, the good man was the one that was sacrificed himself and, and you know, was courageous and brave. And the real man was the one that was just about money and sex and, you know, all of that. Mm. Very clear conceptions. But we cannot do that anymore with women. Why? Because we don't have a concept of a good woman anymore. The good woman is the one who has opportunities and walks through those and tries. She's grasping at something. That's just this constant grasping. It's this constant mm -hmm. careerism or this constant, like you were saying, trying to grasping at it all. But there's no question of, um, you know, morality to it. No question of virtue. No question of goodness, selflessness. It, you know, we have just thrown... Um, 
you know, it's like a, a fire that we just keep adding gas on to because we're trying to tell women that this is really what's going to make you happy. And we're not really giving them a, a way in which they authentically can be happy. Um, right. Because they're not made for that. Like, yeah. It just feels like the goal, goal posts move and um, or seasons change or you know, opportunities come and fade. And we don't have the, we don't have the skill set to really discern that properly because the fact that we've been told over and over again, you know, be ambitious, go for it, make the money, you know, all of this, like that's what we're coached in. And um, so when it it comes to the question of what is it, what does it mean to be a good woman? We don't, we can't even begin to answer that in terms that anybody prior to the 1960s would get, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, people back. uh, And I think men, have an idea of this. They just don't want to say what it is. And you can see it very yeah. clearly in, in poetry. You see it in, in music lyrics, you, you know, all of this um, speaks very loudly about what they think a good woman is. Um, and it's really be- beautiful. I've been reading a lot of um, poetry and um, trying to find love letters and things like this, because I, I, I think they're just so beautiful and tender the way, you know, gruff men in war are, are writing to the women that they love. And, mm. um, you know, there's something that, that, it, it, you know, it's not their ambition that they love. It's just this tender heart that can absorb them and t- enfold them in who they are and bring them a kind of peace and, and goodness and tranquility. Um, so anyway, I, I think it's really fascinating to start looking at what, do, what is it women are really capable of doing and what is it they really offer to others, which I, mm-hmm. I think is also a sense of who, other people are that, that we offer a kind of mirror um, because we reflect others' goodness back to them. Um, mm-hmm. So it, it's these kinds of things that we never hear about because we're so busy being told we have to be the girl boss or right. whatever. And it, this is what's really creating the, the, the tedium and the boredom and the, the discontent. Um, and, you know, women feel like it, the discontent is because they don't have enough yet. So that's, and, and because, so it's it's transformed into rage and anxiety or anger instead of what it really ought to be, which is, you know, a search for something deeper and more beautiful and compelling. Well, it makes me think of your your difficulty in trying to answer that question for your four or five year old daughter. Mm-hmm. You know, what is it? Well, the thing that we excel at is is motherhood. That's the thing that, right. that women can do that men cannot do. And exactly. yet feminism pushed this desire for individuality and severing mm-hmm. that dyad relationship that you described. Yes. And the thing is, is it's so unnatural for women because we're made for relationship with one another. Mm-hmm. And yet you like, that's just how we're designed. That's how our brains work. That's how our mm-hmm. bodies physically work and a physiological mm-hmm. level. And then you expand that and you look at, well, how does this connect with the occult and this desire mm-hmm. for more power? Because that's essentially what it is. It's a desire for control. And that's why yes. women go into the occult. So would you mind talking about mm-hmm. this phenomenon? Because we have celebrities mm-hmm. who are, you know, professing now to be mm-hmm. witches and to be in covens yeah. and things like that. You wrote about it in a great article um, that, that was published, I believe, in the National Catholic Register. Um, mm-hmm. I can't remember Thanks. what that was. I think I can't remember what it was called. I just read it today, though. Um, uh, and feminism that, that, spark DNA is yes, the that's of what it. it is. Yes, and you guys, yeah. if you haven't read it, you need to go read it. But I would love mm-hmm. to talk to you about that connection mm-hmm. between feminism and the yeah. occult specifically, because yeah. a lot of people look at first wave feminism and they they have the same idyllic sort of thought that 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 it was just sort of this pure form of feminism mm-hmm. where they were they were just they just wanted women to have property to be able to own property they just wanted women to be able to vote which mm-hmm. i mean even that i i would say i don't think women probably need to vote um mm-hmm. if they're married or what have you but i would love for you to talk about that last mm-hmm. part of it the occult because no one talks about that part yeah um so this was the one of the pieces that was most astounding to me i Found this book called Satanic Feminism, actually shortly after I finished writing the Anti-Mary Exposed, and I kind of flipped through it. It's a super academic book. It's a dissertation of the Swedish man, and um, he goes through and talks about kind of uh, all the layers of feminism in the 1700s um, and 1800s. Um, and, you know, it's really shocking. It's really, and it, but it's a really tedious book, and I, I didn't get through very much of it because I just didn't need to at that point. Um and then I went back to actually the, the creepy thing was, is that I, I was assuming that this man was against satanic feminism. And then I started reading it more carefully. And I realized like, he's actually a proponent of this. Like this was, he's a very pro satanic feminist 
author or writer, um, scholar. So anyway, that was a really interesting to, to um, you know, figure that out. But the book itself was was remarkable because it went into all these areas that do really get polished over. I mean, we see this in the second wave all the time is the, the amount of occult and things, mental illness, all these kinds of things are really polished over to make the women look like they're very successful and put together. And, you know, the most of this, a lot of the second waivers have just these incredibly tragic stories of how their lives ended or what, what happened to them um, that, you know, the sisterhood could not take care of for them. It's um, you know, because they, they broke themselves up. They separated themselves away from family and thought the sisterhood would, would be what would bring them the, the ultimate happiness that the family couldn't. So, but going all the way back, you've got again, you know, Percy Shelley, who's our, our, you know, the, 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 the mind behind feminism he was hugely into the occult and very much um, he actually spent the night in a tomb um, so that he could conjure up the devil. Uh, he was this man that had saw like no limits, like he just felt like everything he was against. He could withstand everything in the world. And, and you know, tragically, he died in a boating accident when he was 29 years old. And once again, oh, trying to, yeah, very young man. Um, but he also was really interested in this idea of how to re rewrite Genesis three. How do you remake Eve, not into a fallen woman, but how do you cre recreate her in this image of, of a woman who was given an opportunity by the serpent? And oh, that's that what so he did. Evil. Yeah. Yeah. It's so and evil. that's what he did. And that's the idea that got, also got picked up, um, by this woman, Madame, Blavatsky, who started Theosophy. She was this crazy, like Russian noble that traveled to all these places like Tibet and picked up all these different religions and kind of cobbled together what she wanted. And um, but at the heart of it was this idea of the kind of knowledge that Eve received from the serpent. And um, so who picks this up? But Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, who was very much into spiritualism and saw spiritualism as this great opportunity for women, because what does it do? What what did it do? It got rid of men in religion. You no longer needed a priest. All you needed was a bunch of women sitting around a spirit table and, um, you know, getting the knocking back from the, you know, through seances that the spirits would speak to you. And that's how you got answers for everything. Um, and you see this in, in the people that she associated with. She became very anti-Christian later in her life. She wrote this book called The Women's Bible, which you can still get today very, very easily. And, um, you know, it sort of reads like an angry teenager. <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of embarrassingly bad commentary on scripture trying to rewrite, you know, every time a woman appears, she's trying to like write the wrong that she sees happening in the Bible. Um, so this is, you know, the 1800s, which I think we think of as very Victorian. And, yeah. you know, the stat, the research that I did on this just blew that all up. You know, this was there was nothing prudish or pristine about um, certainly the second wave feminism. And, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton actually got herself into so much trouble. She got kicked out of her own organization because the scandals and her book and all of these things were just so deeply problematic that she just she was thrown out. And that's um, and then there was so much infighting. There were two major suffrage groups. There was so much infighting among them that the suffrage movement like was stymied for 30 years. And it wasn't until, you know, the night 1919 that um, it came to pass after the first world war. So it, it's really interesting to start seeing the underbelly of it and to really realize like what what's motivating it and 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 much of it really was this element of the occult and, you know, throughout the, the first wave. And then, of course, the second wave, um, absolutely. And I this I feature a lot in the Anti-Mary Exposed. I went to a, into it probably a lot more in depth in that book than I do in this book. Um, but, yeah, it's just rampant. There's um, there's this one book that I think was kind of a, a handbook for the feminist movement. And it, it actually has this group called Witch which is some kind of acronym. I can't remember what the, 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 the title of it is. Um, but the, the book includes an appendix, which has like everyday spells that you can just use for common experiences. <laughs> I mean, this is like a mainstream, supposedly normal feminist book and it's got spells in it. So this is, you know, it's very common. Um, again, well, that really because, speaks to the, that was, that was expected. There's no explanation in there for why those are in there. It's not like a, mm -hmm. here's your new guidebook. This is, I mean, it's just sort of, yeah. I mean, that's a, you always read between the lines, you know, when you look back on church documents and things like that, yeah. like, well, what's assumed here? 
And like why yeah. they don't explain yeah. this particular dogma, but it was already assumed that everybody understood this thing. Right. This is important. And that's, yeah, yeah. exactly. And so you, you see something like that and it's just understood mm-hmm. that that's what, mm-hmm. how things are when it's just yeah. already there. Wow. Right. Yeah, no, it's pretty amazing. And um, the other r- reality is that you mentioned already is just this idea of power and control. And that's what witchcraft, uh, this is why people are drawn to it because they feel weak and or um, stymied by something and that that witchcraft, you know, gives them a kind of power over things remotely. I mean, this is you see this all over the place. This is why it's predominantly women who are, you know, weaker physically. And so they there it's a, an avenue through which our resentment can be expressed and and revenge can be enacted. So those things are happening simultaneously. So there's a sense of pow- being, becoming powerful over our enemies. Uh, and that's really what what it has been. I mean, feminism is built on envy, on this idea of we need to be like men. And it's this lording and this control and this power over men and against men. And so witchcraft is just absolutely a very natural piece of that um, to gain control of it. So yeah, it's become so commonplace. In fact, I was just at a, a store today and I, just, you know, it's just the new age stuff is, it's just everywhere. Uh, you can't really get away from it. It's very much made to look mainstream and normal and hip and uh, all of that. And, um, you know, it's just scary how prevalent and commonplace it's become in our daily lives. Well, and I, I mean, sometimes the way that it's presented, I mean, I think of as a kid, I mean, a mm-hmm. lot of people, we had a magic eight ball, right? And you would ask it a question, shake it. and Right. Who didn't have the magic eight ball? Exactly. Right. I was just thinking right. about that recently. I saw something yeah. somewhere about, you know, these are typical things in the occult. And I thought, oh my goodness, mm-hmm. we had one of those. You know, we, yeah. my mom would have never allowed us to have a Ouija board or anything like that, but right. we had a magic eight ball. It's like, yeah. well, it's kind of the same thing. You're asking yep. the question and waiting for it to like give you some kind of an answer um and it seems so innocuous right and that that just Mm -hmm. is the beginning Mm -hmm. to going further and asking more questions and wanting especially um the way that these witches and pagans often sort of adopt this this gaia mother earth goddess Mm -hmm. thing looking because they're still looking for a figurehead right but it has to be Mm -hmm. feminine and it has to be nurturing and they're not Mm -hmm. realizing that they're, they're still worshiping something that's created and not yeah. surrendering. You know, it's, it's so mm-hmm. interesting to watch this progression mm-hmm. happen and the way that it's, it is right now. And I do feel like, um, witchcraft is becoming very popular and, mm-hmm. um, and there's like the special time in the church. Like there's just so much resistance to the truth that mm-hmm. this is a unique time to be alive where we get to be hopefully growing as saints like this is a this is what we we're doing real warfare right now i mean this is real spiritual warfare do you okay so there are a couple of questions here and i want to i want to ask you this one first um claire is wondering if we could touch on the role that trauma may play in the attraction to feminism and the occult because there is a very strong connection on trauma yeah. On many levels, whether it's um, sexual abuse or mm-hmm. um, bad relationships with moms, often a lot of the early mm-hmm. feminists um, yeah. were lesbians, but a lot of that was yeah. you often find a correlation there. So what else did you find mm-hmm. um, in the lives of these people that were yeah. adopting this? No, I think that's a great question. And that was one of the things I also discovered. My The first part of my book is actually called The Lost Girls because almost to a one, all of these women, starting with Mary Wollstonecraft and going up through, you know, even second wave feminism, all these women are incredibly broken and they come from either broken homes or kind of abuse, you know, all of this is there. And that that's was the fascinating thing to sort of see that pattern emerge. I mean, these aren't just sort of your everyday women who have had very like Mayberry kinds of, of lives. These are, you know, Mary Wollstonecraft in particular had these horrible parents that you can just see this the disorder that was wreaked in her life because you know her father was this awful alcoholic I mean, there's this horrible story about him hanging the family dog at some point because he got angry and you know abusing his wife and anyway she and she was really in the heart of all that and she had a mother who also was um just unsympathetic and unnurturing she loved her first son for most and nobody else really so so mary took care of the other children and mm-hmm. anyway i mean it's just these horrible stories and um that uh, the fascinating thing to me was that the response because of that trauma was always things have to be changed 
in, in a more liberalizing way, not we need to go back to the 10 commandments or we need to go back to bring order to things, or maybe there was something wrong with my parents and I had a bad impression of what, yes. what ought to, you know, what life ought to be like. Those, those questions are not asked. And instead it just keeps getting pushed further and further. And uh, there's another woman in the book that I talk about who's, who's not well known. She was known in the media back in the 1890s as Mrs. Satan, uh, because she had been a, she was very much a proponent of um, free love. And she had, she had a, was the first woman to have a brokerage firm in New York city because she was a, a medium and she would ask the spirits how people should invest their money. And that's how she got her answers. And um, anyway, I mean, she's this fascinating character. And, um, but tragically she was prostituted from, you know, the beginning of her life. Her mm. father was this literal like snake oil salesman and wanted in like 11 States. And she, it was her relationship. It was the relationship with her that actually brought Elizabeth Cady Stanton down with, because um, she, Cady Stanton saw that Victoria Woodhull had all this fame and people were clamoring, clamoring to know her. And so she invited her to come speak to one of their events. And anyway, it was a disaster. Um, but again, here's this girl that, you know, she, literally she's been prostituted by her own father since she's a very little girl. Um, also mm -hmm. served as mediums and in all these sort of spiritual revivals that are going on around the country, especially in Ohio and New York City. And, you know, this woman doesn't have a chance uh, because she's just so broken and awful, you know, in terms of just what she experienced and lived through and then ultimately what sadly she became. Um, right. And that's the, really the, the pattern that, that we see. So over and over again, or at least I saw, you know, doing research for this book was that movement towards getting rid of things instead of fixing things or saying like, maybe the, this is skewing my vision. Um, so I, I think it's a fascinating thing to, to study how our trauma and sin can, can really blind us to truth. Well, and I find a similar trajectory. You see the same trend basically with uh, divorce, right? Like you have parents who are not getting along and instead of saying, well, we have to have a conversion of heart and renew renew ourselves and grow in holiness to, to yeah. bring sanctification to our marriage and, and healing. Instead, mm -hmm. the answer is always, well, we just need to separate then. No one wants yeah. to put the work in and break yeah. those cycles. And, and yeah. the, the, the people left holding the bag are the kids every single yeah. time. They are the ones carrying the crosses that their parents put down as Layla Miller says. And yeah. um, so it, it just goes to show like so everything we already know that is true mm -hmm. and, and that works is in sacred scripture. Like it's, it's right. in the Catholic church. It's in the deposit yeah. of faith. We know what yeah. works. And, uh, and the church is very clear about that. Thanks be to God. I mean, there are a lot of mm -hmm. people who are part of religions where it's not as clear because it's up to that mm -hmm. individual to determine that. And we mm -hmm. don't have to do the heavy lifting. It's already been done for us. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm. Um, well, and I think that that's another interesting point and important point is the fact that this is coming out of the French Revolution. And what's the French Revolution trying to do? It's trying to get rid of the church entirely, literally like cutting off the heads of priests and religious and I mean, doing incredibly awful things to the church and in the church and um, mm. desacralizing and blaspheming and, you know, def defaming. All of this is happening um, in their in in French culture, which is, you know, is so tightly connected with the church. Um, so that's, you know, this impulse isn't just in women. It's it's in people who are broken is mm. let's get rid of these things. And and even the whole romantic movement that Percy Shelley was a part of, Mary Wollstonecraft was a part of, was this idea of how do we start um, focusing on moving forward in a moral way without the church, without the Ten Commandments. And this is really where the heavy emphasis upon reason um, and virtue came about because they were like, well, these, we've got these things, we, you know, we don't need the 10 commandments. We don't need the church. We've got these things. And of course, we could be a virtuous atheist. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it, it's, it's incredible to see how old these ideas are again, just cycling through over and over again, each generation, you know, following the next. So do you see any trends then that are sort of help or like where you see we might be actually trending in a good direction. I mean, I see a, a lot of women in my life. Um, and I think there is sort of a, a, a 
I don't know, like a pocket of social media, especially Instagram of women trying to reclaim femininity and Mm -hmm. uh, bring beauty into their lives and cultivate relationship and, and true community again. Um, Do you feel like that's just a one-off kind of outlier thing? Or do you think women Mm -hmm. as a whole are, are slowly starting to reject the lies of feminism? Yeah, no, I think it, it's happening. I mean, I, I probably wouldn't have written this book if I didn't think it was happening and people would be open to, to actually buying it and reading it. Um, I think, you know, crazily, Matt Walsh has done more for women than almost anyone in the last decade. Oh, interesting. Um, by asking one, woman? one yeah. stupid question, what is a woman, you know, and really exposing that we have no idea what a woman is. And, and much of it is because of the fact that we've taken away the concept of, of motherhood from women. And, and I don't mean that just biologically, I mean, psychologically and spiritually as well. And the church obviously has the long and gorgeous tradition and and history of spiritual motherhood, especially with religious. So I I think that that um, has been, has really sparked something that, that, and now, you know, even talk in talking about this book, you know, a lot of times I encounter people that, from all kinds of walks of life, you know, just in my daily life. And so I actually have a way to sort of frame this and say, well, why, how do we get to this point where we don't even know what a woman is? And no matter what stripe of political, you know, preference they are, they still have to admit that we don't know how to define a woman. And so then it starts a conversation which probably wouldn't have happened otherwise if I had just told them the name of my book or something like that. So yeah. uh, I feel like there's a way to actually start having these conversations with people. And, and, you know, I'm a big fan of asking questions and uh, I think that that's just such an effective tool. And Matt Walsh has used that so well in a way that has helped so many of us, um, you know, I think move forward in this. Well, and I think the only way we are going to move forward is if we are engaging people with a degree of honest until like, intellectual Mm -hmm. honesty where we're Mm -hmm. assuming charitable things about them. I think it's really Mm -hmm. easy to have the us versus them mentality that we sort of talked about because we like black and white. It's really easy for us. We want to identify who our tribe is and who we are Mm -hmm. fighting against. It's how we create Mm -hmm. our own communities. And that's very natural. But if we're going to bring healing, we do have to find common ground where without compromising, Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying betray what you believe, but find common ground where where possible and acknowledge that a lot of this, all of it is really rooted in, in brokenness because that's what the enemy does. Mm -hmm. He deceives Mm -hmm. and he divides and, and like, we have to, we have to rise above that um, Mm -hmm. in our conversations about feminism and new age and all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I do have one other question here that I did want to ask. Um, hard knock life here is asking, what does Dr. Gress think about capitalism? And I think that's an interesting question because, uh, of the economic Mm -hmm. position that we're in now where women Mm -hmm. sort of have to be in the workforce Mm -hmm. for our economy to continue as it is. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Um, well, I mean, this could be a whole book, I think, in, in a lot of respects, because I think what, one of the things we, we talk about capitalism today, we're not really dealing with pure capitalism, we're dealing with crony capitalism. And I I think that that's um, an important thing to be mindful of. Um, You know, this isn't really a normal ordered free market. This is absolutely, you know, corrupt capitalism. Um, So I think that that's problematic. I think the, um, the alternative of communism, and, you know, we haven't talked about this at all yet, but just to see what happened in the 1900s to feminism, because, you know, we talked about the 1800s and how the the, the layers of the occult. Well, in the 1900s, feminism really started like grafting on to communism. And um, this was really the motivator of Betty Friedan. And yes. it, those three things that I mentioned, you know, free love, the occult and um, and this radical egalitarianism or smashing the patriarchy. Those things fit onto communism like hand and glove. You just have to replace the occult with atheism, which, of course, is a very easy trade off um, when you're trying to take on a whole group of, of, you know, half the population. Of course, the communists are not going to care if there's a cult it enters into the discussion. Um, so uh, that was another really interesting area to, to look at it. Um, and again, I don't mean to suggest that these are the only options, communism, capitalism, but I think that this is the way that we think about things again, because we like right. the binary. Um, but I think that um, Betty Friedan absolutely was very much influenced by Marx and Engels. She she always said that she 
was just started being interested in feminist feminism and um, women's issues in the 1950s, which is absolutely not true. Um, she was very much, you know, I found articles and things like that that she had written. And there's a whole book actually written by a friend of hers that outlines her communist background. And uh, the, Betty Friedan was not interested in helping this man write this book. But he wanted to write it because he thought it was just amazing that she was this communist that was able to navigate around McCarthyism, that she was never called out as a communist and, and really canceled by McCarthyism. So that was his whole focus with the, the author of this, Daniel Horowitz is his name, um, was to, to expose her, you know, in a friendly way as a communist. And, and so we see in her work things like um, there was some journal entry that she had where she spoke about how women would never be free unless they got out of the home and they were doing productive work outside the home. Because at that stage, communists have already decided that raising children was not productive. So they had to get out of the home. So all of this mirrors exactly what happened in the Soviet Union, except it was put in much different terms. Um, the Soviet Union was very much a military overtaking our overtaking in a communist role was very much um, a cultural one. And so Betty Friedan, who was a, had a degrees um, in psychology, used all these amazing tactics to convince us that, you know, we were missing out on something or we were victims, that the home was this comfortable concentration camp that we absolutely had to get out of or else we would be miserable. So she did this, you know, snow job on all of us to, to believe that the home was this awful place. And of course, you know, fast forward, 50, 60 years, um, you know, she wrote her book, The Feminine Mystique in, in 1963. And of course, we're now in 2023. And you can see very clearly how much we bought into it. But at the same time, how much things of the home have come back, like people have this desire and yearning for home. And this has been one of the reasons why theology of home has been so successful. And people, you know, I think are really drawn to it, because all the elements of, of home are really attractive and compelling and beautiful. And all of them are popular again, you know, not just among Catholics, but on a secular level. What is not popular yet is still calling oneself a homemaker, even mm -hmm. though we do all these things that are homemaking technically. Um, well, it's fine if you hire somebody to do those things. Sure. But heaven right. forbid you, you do call them, yourself that. No, right? no, you call yourself that because exactly. that's the thing, or it's not just a hobby. Um, so. <laughs> Anyway, I, I think it's a, um, you know, it's been really interesting to just see how loaded feminism is in, in leftism. Um, absolutely. The, the new left took over feminism in the, the second wave. You've got and um, Angela Davis and Kate Millett, who were absolutely disciples of the, the Frankfurt School. So anyway, I don't want to get too much in the minutia, um, but I, I think what we're seeing is this crony capitalism, which is a lot of leftism built into it and, and is highly, um, you know, hugely problematic. So this, um, this viewer is saying, okay, but capitalism is reinforcing feminism in the U S right now. Um, mm -hmm. what do you, what do you like, do you have a response mm -hmm. to that? Because I mean, in a sense it's true well, because it keeps women out of their homes. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I think this is a tough thing, but the impetus behind it is actually communism. Communism is the one that's telling we have, telling us we have to do productive work. Um, there's also, you know, absolutely, I think there's a problem with avarice that that drives that. There's also this, uh, you know, even the the things like where have the nuns gone so that now, yes. you know, how do how yes, do I'm we like we them? had this solved. They can the nuns right. were teachers. They were working right. in hospitals. Right. We had the feminine. Um, yeah, genius, so to speak, as JP2 yeah. would say, uh, doing what is natural to things. them without mm -hmm. sacrificing the family. And and because we've become sort of a, a, a two child family, you also have things that are just, you know, home prices have skyrocketed because now there's people, you know, our family, we, we've lived for a long time on one income and we just couldn't do it and still educate our, our children. So there's two of us working now, but part of that is because of school prices and, and home prices, you know, all of these things that are just imploding because of that. So I'm, I'm certainly sympathetic to that, but I think the real driver is the fact that women have been told they have to be workers. I think that enough yeah. of us said, I'm going to stay home with my children, then you wouldn't see that the inflationary elements happen. You would also, see, you know, if there was a sense of real spiritual motherhood, 
we wouldn't have had that crisis with um, with the religious in in the 1960s and beyond. Um, so yeah, I, I think the real the 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 start of that was absolutely communism and and leftism, and that's when it's really been promoting it. But it's it's and, and again, there's problems with capitalism. The av avarice is a huge issue. Keeping up with the Joneses, all of those kinds of things are are problematic. But I think if we were going to start somewhere, it's it's not with capitalism per se it's with yeah the, the roots of feminism i totally agree because i mean i think people don't understand especially maybe men because like the way that we're raised is it's just different like you know at school education is very much ordered towards teaching girls it's i mean and and the mm -hmm. whole time you're in school your teachers are always telling you you're going to do something amazing someday and it's <laughs> always understood that it's right. not motherhood. It's going yep. to be a career. Like exactly. that's something that's going back to that article that I wrote about in Christ or wrote in mm -hmm. Crisis Magazine. That's exactly what I talked about. And then when a woman is, is you know, in her career, she feels like this is how she's going to be productive. And not only that, but often her mom didn't teach her the skills for motherhood yeah. and homemaking. And yep. so you're expecting a woman who has not been taught how to be a mother. It wasn't modeled for her often because her mother mm -hmm. wasn't nurturing or her mother was working herself. And then she's been educated for 16 plus years that how to have a career. Nobody's primed her for motherhood. And so she becomes a mom and you bring, she comes home with a baby and all of a sudden it's very overwhelming because she's yeah. still trying to keep her job. She's learning how to take care of a baby for the first time in her life. And she's still learning how to be God willing, a wife and a mother. And that's a huge learning curve. And so it's a lot easier for them to relegate the task of child rearing to a, a daycare provider because that's what's expected. No one's going to judge her for that. Right. And yeah. she can continue doing the things that she has been trained to do, which is a career and bringing money home. So um, mm -hmm. I think it's just hard maybe for men to understand that that's where we're brainwashed into that. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think also even you know, there's something very hard when you're growing up about saying, I want to be married. I mean, there, I remember growing up and just people joking about like, oh, she's just in college because she wants an MRS degree. You know I mean? It's a very yeah. old concept, but what a walk of shame that was to, for someone to, to, you know, be branded with that. Um, and, you know, even as Catholics, the, the vocational question isn't something that a woman can just strategize and solve. She cannot make the man that she's going to marry materialize on her own. She cannot make these career, you know, the way that she makes choices in her career, she can't make these choices about meeting a mate because it's not something that she can do. So there's, even in that, there's a certain amount of something that has to be gifted to us that we are not trained to do. We're, we're told and trained the way you articulated beautifully to go out and grasp at things and get things and be focused on that. And so it's very unsettling and difficult and takes a lot of rewiring and prayer to, to sort of start thinking about these things in, in dramatic, dramatic ways um, and new ways. So, yeah, I think all of that is really important for us to be mindful of is just how mm -hmm. challenging it really is to start thinking of ourselves as mothers if we've never been, you know, trained or seen all of it, if that hasn't been modeled for us. Well, I don't, I don't know about you, but I, it's wild to me in hindsight, but I was, even when I was an anti-abortion activist in college, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I never really envisioned what motherhood would look like. I, I couldn't yeah. even right. growing up, yeah. growing up, I yeah. never thought about what it would be like to have kids. I figured I'd get married, but I mm -hmm. never once, I'm not kidding. And I'm, I'm out on the front lines trying to save babies and talking to moms, helping moms become mothers. I ran a pregnancy center. At, um, I started running a pregnancy center shortly after I had my first. But yeah, I mean, it was like, I never thought about motherhood. I didn't, I mean, right. if you were to ask me how many kids I would have, I was, I don't know, maybe a couple or something. I don't, it just wasn't <laughs> something I thought about. Yeah. And, and nobody helped me think about that either. It's just mm -hmm. wild to me. So, but I don't think I'm the only one, you know? No, absolutely. And I think that's one of the things that's super important for all women, especially women who are older to, to start mentoring younger women, even if it's not in a direct way, but you know, I love that idea of just having a woman over to just be around her kids and bake something yes. together, you know, those kinds of very simple things that are actually really enjoyable, have a glass of wine and just sit around and talk and do something and, and let, 
people see what family life is like. And I think a lot of times we feel like our, uh, if we invite people over, everything has to be really perfect. And I think it's important for people to see the not perfect as well. And to, to realize that this is, you know, things go on and this is how kind of children are raised in the, the midst of this chaos. But yeah, I, I always wanted a lot of children. Uh, I think once I started, once I accepted the idea that I would get married, um, you know, and became, once I really became Catholic, um, but yeah, I remember my, it's actually my husband who taught me how to cook. He was an, he's an excellent cook. My husband did too, actually <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I, I didn't know how to like cook a chicken. You know, I thought a really good dinner was like, here's some pasta sauce in the jar <laughs> and I like always, pasta, and, you know, solid food, right? Yeah. Right. Here's some salad from the box and, you know, all that yeah. kind of stuff. But um, so yeah, I think all of that. And now that I've, I've had my fifth child, I, in fact, at one point I was kind of laughing cause I thought this feels really easy. Like, why does this feel easy? You know, and not that it's objectively easy, but the fact that a lot of the anxieties that you have with your early children are gone because you know yeah. what to do. Like, I remember my worst fear was like, what do I do when she starts like vomiting? You know, like I was just scared to death of yeah. flus and, um, I think once you sort of deal with that, then you realize like, okay, this is how you, you know, you move on and it's not, it's not this like a, a huge fear anymore. Um, mm -hmm. So that was another really amazing. And of course I also had older children that could help at that stage too, which I never mm -hmm. had before when I had the first four very close together. So that was an incredible gift, especially because I don't live near family. I don't have close friends that I could just pass people off to or children off to at different stages. So yeah. it was a really amazing thing to have the fifth and be able to say, can you just pick up the baby for a while? Right. Um, so it's those things that you just don't hear about because so many of us, again, are so focused on the career that we just don't even begin to imagine what happens over time and how a family grows and, and grows into the numbers and all of that. It's really beautiful, actually. Yeah. And that lack of community too, because so many women are working, whereas, you know, you used to have all the moms at home and they would get together right. during the day with their kids. We don't have that anymore. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, I just would ask people who are very hard. I mean, I feel like a lot of people are hard. There are a lot of women who are working that would really rather not be working. Mm -hmm. um, but we can't know exactly their financial situation. We can't mm -hmm. exactly know their support system. Um, I mean, I, yeah, the mental health aspect, I'm not saying mm -hmm. that I think women should be out of their homes working. I don't believe mm -hmm. that. I, that's why I don't. Um, mm -hmm. But I think we have to look with a little more compassion and look at the bigger picture because um, yeah. they just, they weren't taught how to be moms. And, mm -hmm. and if they don't have that support system in place, it's just really hard to break those cycles, um, especially if you don't even see that there's a cycle that needs to be broken. Right. So, and there's a lot of pressure from all kinds of sides, I think, too. So and and there's also seasons of life, too, that for sure change a lot and, um, you know, take on different tasks. I know this is why I started writing, because I was home and, you know, I'd finished my Ph.D. and I thought, well, I can write a book if I just finish that dissertation. So uh, anyway, and it worked amazingly. I don't well. know how you did that, but that's amazing. <laughs> so, well, it's a whole other <laughs> conversation, but uh in any event, yeah, it was, um, but, but I think that it worked well. Like I remember writing my dissertation and I would work on it at night after the children are in bed. And, and then the next day I would think about what I was going to write that night. Like I just could process mm. what I had already done and what needed to be done. So it was really an amazing um, dynamic because I wasn't doing a lot of heavy lifting intellectually during the day. And then at night I could kind of balance things out. So it, it worked out really well, but. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, what, do you have any other things coming up here soon that people should be paying attention to? I'd love to give you a, an opportunity to talk more about your work before we sign off. Yeah. Today. No, I mean, I think um, it, my time has really been consumed by the um, the end of woman um, of late. But um, of course, we're always doing stuff at Theology of Home. It's our busy season now as, as Advent and Christmas are hitting. Um, and that's been, I, I think, really just the incredible blessing because it feels like through those books, we can gently and lovingly and beautifully show women a different way to, to live their lives, that these are not weirdos that are doing, <laughs> you know, staying at home with their children. And um, Emily Malloy just published uh, for us the Theology of Home 4, which is arranging the seasons. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's stunning. She's, she's this like force of nature. It's amazing. It's on my wish list to get all of everything. Yeah. My, my husband, I have a lot of books. 
Mm-hmm. So my husband is always like, you need to stop buying books. Yeah. No, I believe me. I get that. But, uh, yeah, this is going to be, I I'm excited about it because it feels like such a great, um, gift to give, especially Christmas. But, um, yeah, it, it's just so well done. She grew all the flowers. She arranged all the flowers. She styled all the images. She took all the photos. I mean, this is wow, like a, that's a work of love. Like that is amazing. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I, amazing. I don't know anybody else that could do all of those things and pull it off so beautifully and compellingly. She wrote the text, you know, all of that. So, uh, Noelle and I just sit back in awe that she was able to pull this off because we certainly had a professional photographer, you know, we did our books. And so, yeah, that's, um, that's been new and fun. And, um, yeah, I think there's just, we're always trying to figure out how do we, how do we help women understand themselves as women in a way that's compelling, that uses the culture that, you know, is beautiful instead of awkward and kitschy or whatever. Yes. So, yeah. Um, so we'll see what the new year brings, but it, it's do been a wonderful job. Oh, you thank really you. Do. So wow. we know that's how the, 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 the culture was destroyed was through, these kinds of books through daytime TV and um, magazines, you know, all of that. So it just seems fitting that we should start reclaiming some of this. And, um, you know, one of these days I would love to have oodles of money and be able to start an actual magazine and, um, you know, have it come out monthly, but uh, we're not there yet. So we'll see. Not yet. Someday. Yeah. That's amazing. Thank you for coming on to integrated and chatting me chatting with me about all of these amazing things i think that was just a great conversation to cover we covered everything we covered a lot we so a lot thank you so much yeah. my pleasure thanks so much for having me thanks everyone who joined today in the chat um again please feel free to subscribe like and share and we will see you next time mm-hmm.